Okay, then we start. So I would like to welcome you all to this today's webinar where we are going to talk about how to create plots easily. Uh, my name is Anne Holmberg from ClueCore. Uh, I think many of you have already heard me in other webinars. So you are very welcome to attend this webinar, which according to plan will take a maximum 45 minutes. Uh, I will spend a few minutes just giving you a little introduction for those who haven't uh, encountered ClueCore before, and then we will move on to the actual plots. So let's try also to maximize this. Uh, so the background of this company is that we are a Swedish company, uh, a spin-off from the University of Lund in the south of Sweden. So everything started in 2001 uh, and the company was founded in 2007. And today we have customers in 35 countries and head office in Sweden. Uh, uh, and two smaller offices on the east coast of the US. Uh, we have a number of customers in the industry, as you can see, and uh, also a large number of customers in academia. Uh, so mainly Western Europe and the US, uh, a little bit in, in Asia and other parts of the world as well. And many of these uh, customers have published. So there is a long list, I think six or seven uh, hundred publications on our home uh, homepage that you can have a look at. Also a couple of case studies and uh, we have publications in many of the large papers as you can see. Uh, and what ClueCore Omics Explorer is, in a few words, is that it's a very fast and easy to use tool to analyze and explore data without being a statistical expert. And my guess is that most of you that have joined are uh, bench scientists, uh, biologists, or, or maybe medical doctors. And a smaller portion of you uh, might have a, a bioinformatic uh, expertise or uh, our, uh, statisticians. And that I would say mimics also our customer base. The majority are people that don't have access to so many other tools. Uh, and uh, a number of our users are also statistical experts uh, that have access to other tools, but that appreciate the ease uh, of use and visualization capabilities of the software. So a few words on what you can do in ClueCore. You can visualize and explore data to find new structures and generate new hypotheses. And uh, I will show you an example of this in one of the workflows that I'm going to show you. Then we can do statistical analysis, of course. When you have a hypothesis, you might want to do a statistical analysis to find discriminating variables. Uh, so that could be, for instance, a t-test, ANOVA, regression analysis. And we also have an open API to R where you can plug in your R scripted methods. So I will show you a couple of examples of statistical analysis as well. And when you have found interesting genes or proteins or metabolites, you might want to do pathway analysis. And you can do, do that using the built-in gene set enrichment analysis tool. Uh, this is not something that we will cover today, but that there uh, are separate webinars on that that you can join. And if you have a data set with very strong signals, you can also build a classifier using the built-in machine learning algorithms that we have in the software, uh, like KNN support vector machines, random trees, XGBoost. And then you can use these classifiers for prediction in a new data set. And that is something that we talk about more in the advanced training. We have one separate module in the software. The base modules contains almost everything, but then we also have the NGS module, which is a genome browser. And with that, it's possible to perform synchronized RNA-seq analysis and genome browsing in the same session. And you can also show gene fusions in circle plots. 
So here you can look for variant mutations and visualize them in the genome browser. And you can use your normal statistical filtration on your expression data as a filter into the genome browser so that you focus only on your genes of interest. And there is a separate webinar on that as well. Uh, so we will not talk more about that today. The data types that we cover are gene expression data like RNA-seq and array data, also single cell RNA-seq, DNA methylation, proteomics, metabolomics, and a long list of other data types, as you can see. And we support a number of different file formats, such as aligned BAM files for RNA-seq data, for instance, and also cell files for from Affymetrix or Thermo Fisher. Agilent text files. Uh, we can download data directly from Gene Expression Omnibus and also from TCGA. We can load, we have a pipeline for 10x genomics data and for all other types of data, as long as you can save it in Excel uh, or uh, make a data matrix in Excel, save it as a TXT or CSV file, then we can bring it in using the wizard. Uh, and these are the file formats that are supported by the uh, NGS module, the, the genome browser module. So we can cover basically any multivariate data with this software. Okay, so the agenda for today is <clears throat> that we will, I will show you five workflows and in each of these workflows I will show you a couple of plots. The first workflows is an F-test or an ANOVA on proteomics data. And here we will have a look at the PCA plot, a heat map, a heat map and a box plot. Um, so let's have a look at that. So let's just go there. And, and after each of these, I will, uh, you have a possibility to ask questions in the chat. So I will open the software here. And then I will load the, or I can present this exactly. So this is the first workflow, the F-test on proteomics data. And the proteomics data set that I'm going to use is a mass spec data set, MaxQuant from the Pride archive and it deals with dying and surviving cancer cells after chemotherapeutics. So I, and we will load this file from, uh, via the wizard, because this is a data set that is stored as a TX, in TXT format. So here we are, this is the wizard, I press next, and now I see my data set. So up here we have information about, all the information that is known about the samples, which uh, cell line, which drug that has been used for treatment, is it attached or detached, and so on. And here are all the protein names. And here is the actual measured data. And then we just answer the questions in the wizard here. Is this a raw count matrix? No, this is not RNA-seq data, it's mass spec data. What is the separator? It, it's tab separated, that's correct. Are the rows, are they variables or samples? They are variables. Next. Then select the top left cell of the data matrix. This is the first measured data point. Next. Select the top right cell of the data matrix. Then we go all the way here and select the top right cell. Next, click on variable annotation header cells. This is the cell that uh, describes the variables. Next, click on sample annotation header cells. We pick everything here and then we press finish. And that brings the data set in and as Every new data set is opened up and visualized as a PCA plot. So here we are, and in the PCA plot, the simple uh, rule that we work with 
is that samples that are close together, they are similar to each other, and samples that are far apart are different from each other. So we are looking for clusters of samples. So we are looking at the 90 samples, that is what we see here, and their position in the plot is based on the expression of the 5,600 proteins. So let's color them. So we have a couple of annotations here, but let's focus on the cell type here, like that. So there are three different cell types, and we can see immediately that they are different from each other, even though there are differences within the groups, but there are, the cell types are clearly separated. Uh, and the three axes in the PCA plot represents how much variation you find in each direction here. So along the first principal component axis, you find the most information. Along the second axis in this direction, you find the second most information. And along the third, you find third most information. And there are as many PCA axes as there are variables. So, but in the PCA plot, we, we can only look at three dimensions at a time. And by looking at the three dimensions where we have the most information, you often get a very, uh, you get a true picture of a data set, even uh, if it's not the complete picture of your data set. So this is very, very valuable to be able to visualize your data in three dimensions. Because then we can immediately see that there are differences between the groups here. Okay, now we want to do a statistical test. So we want to do an F test or an ANOVA test. And in CLUCOR, that is uh, represented by what we call a multi-group comparison, to be very clear what it is. When you have uh, more than two groups, you need to use the multi-group comparison. And then we select the annotation that we want to test and cell. And since it's a multi-group comparison, we will now look for proteins that are good at separating all these three groups from each other. So now I filter down and I filter down to uh, about a couple of hundred of the best, like that. Let me just see my little script here, yep, like that. So now you see that the Q values are really fantastic. If I had stopped at the Q value of, for instance, 0.05 or so, I would, I would have found over 3,000 proteins, but I'm interested in a shorter list, so I just continue to filter. So it's more the size of the list now than the, the Q values, because the Q values are fantastic. And the Q values are represented by the false, uh, are equal to the false discovery rate, according to Benjamini Hochberg, as you may already know. Okay. So looking at only these 500 proteins, we see that we get an even better separation uh, of the cell types. And we see that there is a subgroup within this cell type, and that could, for instance, maybe be due to detached or, or attached cell types, or maybe treatment. But we, we won't go into that uh, this time. Instead, we will open up a new synchronized plot and make that a heat map. We can start with only the heat map like that. And we now go to the View tab, and I press Auto on both the sample side and the variable side to see everything. And then I hierarchically cluster on both the variable sample and the variable side. And I color this also in the same way according to cell. And then we see that we have a really good separation of the different cell types. So we have found proteins that are very discriminating between the different cell types. If we zoom in a little bit here on the variable side, we will also see the the names of the proteins like this. And then we might want to go back and see everything again, so then we just press auto. Okay, uh, then we tile the plots and we have them side by side like this. So this is a very common view that you work with the PCA plot and the heat map side by side. 
And the heat map is, of course, uh, dynamic. So if I change the filtration here, you will see that the heat map updates as we go along here. Uh, like that. Uh, what I forgot to do was that I wanted to also save a list here. So let's do that. So here I have a list of my proteins. So let's just make a copy of that and call that F test on cell type like that. And I want to add a column here for Q value and sort on that column. So now I have the best proteins on the top and the worst, but still very good at, at the bottom of the list, like that. Then I would like to view some of these proteins in a box plot. So then I open up a new synchronized plot and make that a box plot. So then I go to the method tab and find a box plot like that. Let's maximize that for the moment. Then I go to the axis data selection and say that I would like to show cell type on the x-axis and I would like to pick one or several proteins to show on the y-axis. So I pick here from somewhere in the middle of the list. So here, for instance, here I now picked four. I can pick pick up to show up to 64 in the same picture, but maybe let's go back to only show one. It's easier to see them. Okay, and let's go to the options tab and say that I want to also see the individual samples for each of the groups here. And up here you can see that we show the individual p values between the groups. So in an F-test, you find variables that are good at separating the groups, but you don't know which group it's good at separating. But here you get more information. So you see that the best separation is between the, uh, the yellow and the blue cell type. The second best separation is between the yellow and the pink uh, cell types. But the separation between the blue and the pink cell types is not so good, as you can see up here. And here you can choose from uh, three different uh, p-values. Uh, I can see that I have made the lines a bit thicker, so I go back to thinner lines like that. Okay, I can also add a second x-axis, so let's do that. In the view tab, I go back here to the axis data selection for the x-axis and say, I would also, I would like to have the source attached or detached on the on a second x-axis. And then you see that here you have the results for the attached cells, and here you have the result for the detached cells. So in this case, they, they behave very similarly. Okay, and then we can tile all of these plots like this, and maybe we want to export one of them. Uh, let's say I want to export the heat map uh, like that. So then I just mark the heat map, right click in the heat map, do export image, uh, heat map, put it on the desktop, save. Then I pick the resolution. Maybe I want this. Here you have the approximate DPI on A4 letter paper. It's OK. And that will export the heat map. Here we are with its legend. In this case, we only had the actual heat map legend and the, the, the sample color legend, like that. OK, so that was the first workflow. So let's go back here. And let me see, do we have any questions on this? I open up the chat. No, then we just move on.
to the next workflow where we are going to have a look on uh, a transcriptomics data set, which is a data set that we have downloaded, will download from GEO, uh, Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia data set. And here we will show the results in uh, a volcano plot and also compare uh, some of, of the results in a Venn diagram. So then we go to the log tab and close down this data set, like this. And then we load this second data set from GEO. So I do download GEO data set. I know the number, so I type it in like that. You can also browse the curated data sets or the newer non-curated data sets here and look for a data set of interest. It asks if I want to download all the annotations. Yes, I do. And here we are. So this is a very fast process. Uh, so here I have now downloaded a data set with 190 samples and 22,000 different uh, variable, 22,000, yeah, genes or, or actually probes. Uh, it came with its annotations, so let's have a look at them. We have one annotation describing the different disease subtypes here. So let's use that. And we can see that the blue group here seems to separate quite well from the rest, and that's TALL, T cell leukemia. So let's do a T test on that. Two group comparison on this annotation and TALL. So this now means that I'm comparing this group with the rest of the active samples. If I would decide that I don't want to include this uh, blue group, I can just take it away and it won't be included in, in the analysis. But I do want to keep it, so I put it in again. And then I drag the statistical slider here to let's say, a good Q value, so a Q value of 0.01. That gives me 5,000 uh, variables. Uh, I want a shorter list, so I continue to filter. So again, this is a data set with very, very strong signals. So I go down to the 800 best variables or so. Doesn't really matter so much. That was, yeah, like that. Okay, and then I switch to a volcano plot. Now, before I do that, I save this. I make a copy of this list and call that t test on t sorry t a l l versus versus rest that. Then I change this to a Volcano plot, and here we are. Let's change back here to circles like that. And let's now configure the volcano plot. So I would like the lines here to be log fold change plus minus one. And I would like the p uh, minus log p uh, cutoff be 30. So now I can highlight, or let, let's make it 31 so that you see the line. Uh, so now these are my uh, selected genes. And I can also color them. So I go to the View tab and color by fold change, for instance, like that. And I can also label, using the label tool here, say that I'm interested in this one. I prefer to see the gene symbols. I change to that. And I maybe I'm also interested in these ones over here, like that. Um, and the volcano plot is dynamic. So if I filter on, on fold change here now, you see that I take away from the middle of the plot. If I filter on p-value or q-value, you see that I take away or add from the bottom of the plot, like that. And now I would like to show you a 
Venn diagram. So we open up a new synchronized plot and we make that a Venn diagram. So method tab, all, Venn. So far I only have one list. I have one more, but that's uh, proteomics data, so I can't compare that because they don't have the same unique identifier. But I have some other lists that I want to compare with, so I can actually import them. Of course, I could have made more lists on this data set, but now I want to compare with lists that I have previously made. So here I have three that I would like to use. So cell membrane receptors, kinases, and protein binding. Okay, so let's use them to see what kind of overlap we have here. So we have cell membrane receptors. Okay, so some of them are cell membrane receptors. Uh, let's kinases. Yeah, some of them are kinases. We can also make the plot proportional like this. And if we add a fourth group, uh, then uh, the diagram will look like this. So this, you can see it's very, very easy to create a Venn diagram once you have your, your lists that you want to compare. And then we can tile the plots again. Okay, uh, any questions on that before we move on? No. Um, then we go on. The next workflow that we will, I will show you is a uh, ex where we work with exploration of transcriptomics data, and here we will work with uh, um, the PCA plot again a Tisney plot and also have a look at the Scree plot and see how that can, can be helpful in our analysis. So let's continue with that. So then we go here and we close this data set. From the log tab, we close this like that. And then we open a one of the example data sets that we have here. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia data set. Uh, and here we have 132 samples and again 22,000 uh, genes or probes. And now we will not do a statistical analysis, instead we will do an exploration. So we will use the variance filtration uh, and filter on uh, yeah, the variance tab to filter on standard deviation. Each of the 22,000 genes uh, have a standard deviation based on how much they vary in expression for the samples. So a gene that has the same expression for all the samples has a standard deviation of zero. And if a gene that varies between the samples has a higher standard deviation. So we will filter on variance like this, standard deviation. And now you see that once, so we filter away genes that don't vary so much. And now we start to see some structure. We see a group of samples that uh, appear here. So, so far we filtered down to 3,000 genes. So we have filtered away 19,000. Um, let's continue here. So it's a bit hard to know when to stop filtering. Uh, if you filter too far, you only get two groups or only one sample. To help you with this, we have created uh, this projection score. So we, uh, the projection score is the informativeness of this plot compared to a random data set of the same size. 
and we are looking for a maximum, not a specific number, but a maximum. And uh, if it's green, it indicates that the signal is very strong. But in order to ha avoid looking for the maximum, I can use the OPT button here, and that will bring me automatically to the optimum projection score. So with this OPT, uh, it filters down to the 207 best uh, variables or genes, with the highest uh, expression. And that reveals one very clear group, as you can see. Here we are. I don't know what it is, but it's very interesting. So let's remember that group by creating a new annotation like that, color on this. Then we use the annotate mouse tool to annotate this group. So this is now the yellow group. Um, and let's see if we have something else. Yeah, we also have one group here. So let's create a new group and annotate that as well. Like that. And then we can take away these new groups to help the data set open up. And that can help us find more groups. So, and let's also use the networking function here. So now we connect each sample to its two closest neighbors, giving you according to the Euclidean distance. And then we find two more groups here. So let's create values for them and annotate them as well. So here we have one group like that. And here we have another one like that. Okay. And we can continue and take away groups, but let's stop there and put back the groups and see what we have found. So, so far we have found four groups in this data set. Now we will continue and open up a new type of plot called a Tisney plot. So here we are, a 2D Tisney, and here we need to press calc. We can also set them side by side like this, and we will color according to the new annotation that we just created so that they are colored in the same way. Uh, in the PCA plot, the distances between the samples that you see are real. Uh, in the TISNI, they are uh, uh, increased. So the, the TISNI algorithm automatically clusters samples, moves samples that it believes belongs together closer to each other and distances other samples from each other. So this is a, a biased plot and your input here is the perplexity. So the perplexity is your best guess on how big the clusters are. So you need to test a couple of different perplexities to make sure that you get a stable outcome. And if you use it side by side with the PCA plot like this, you, you have, you can say, a sanity check of the TISNI plot. Um, the uh, Tisney plot is used a lot when you work with single cell data where you have a lot more samples and it, it can be hard to find clusters in the PCA plot. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very useful tool. And in the Tisney plot now we can see that we, it seems like we can find one more uh, group of samples. So let's, or maybe two, here is one and here is one. So let's annotate them as well. and. So here we have one. So let's just see this one and this one. And here we have one like that. So you can continue the exploration in the Tisney plot and it, that will also update now the PCA plot. Okay, that's very interesting. And of course I can continue taking away samples, but the next, phase in this is of course to try to explain what is it that I have found? Is it something new or things that I already knew about? So let's change this now to a the PCA plot also to a Tisney plot to be able to compare. And let's color it according to something that we know. We have an annotation called leukemia type specifying B cell and T cell leukemia. And then we see that this first group that we found here, this very clear group, that's T cell leukemia. 
Okay, so that was not a new finding. Then we have an annotation called leukemia subtype where we have diagnosed a lot of different, the patients have been diagnosed with a lot of different known subtypes. So let's look at this. Okay, so here we have a match. Here we have a partial match, but according to the diagnosis, this group belongs to this group. According to the clustering pattern, this could be a group of its own. And here we have found something very interesting because this group has been diagnosed as other. The green group here is other. But here we can see that a couple of samples in the other group seems to be a group of its own. So this is probably a new finding together with this. And we can also see that one of the samples over here in the blue group have been diagnosed as other. But if we look at the how it clusters, it looks like as if this patient probably suffers from the blue leukemia type. Okay, so this is a quick example how you can work with the PTA plot and the TSN plot when you're doing exploration. Uh, we should. We will also now have a look at what you can do with a, a bit of a specialized plot called the scree plot, how that can be helpful. The scree plot shows you how much information you have on each, uh, in each dimension, on each the P, of the PCA axis. Um, and here you see that we have a lot of information on, in the first three axes. We still have quite a lot of information on the fourth and also on the fifth, and then it starts to level out. Okay, how can I use this information? Let's change this to a PCA plot again, and let's open up the here statistics. So when we do the uh, find the optimum here, before we used the default three dimensions, but we can change that and say that I would like to find the optimal projection score in five dimensions. And then you see that before we found just over 200, and, uh, 200 variables, now we find 180. The projection score is higher, it was 0.43 before. So now we are using all the information on the five first uh, PCA axis. So that's how you can make use of a scree plot. Okay, then we continue. Any questions on this? Let's open the chat. Uh, yeah, I got a question, but I, I uh, regarding uh, how to compare GC data. I think I will save that question. If you can stay after this webinar, I can uh, show you some things uh, on this if you like. Uh, but for now, I, I continue with the, the actual plots that we are working with here. Uh, any questions on this? No, then we continue. Uh, the fourth workflow here. Uh, in this, we are going to work do a regression analysis or a linear regression on a, a smaller transcriptomics data set where we're going to see if we can find any correlation with age and we're going to show the results in the heat map and in scatter plots. So let's go over here and again we close down this current data set and we open up the other uh, example data set, which is a smaller transcriptomics data set with only 12 samples and 50 variables, as you can see down here. And here we have the annotation age. So if I now color on that, okay, so then I have one color per age and that doesn't really help me to understand what is what until I unless I look very, very carefully here, but that's too hard. So let's instead create a color gradient to help us. So I use this little tool here and say, select the first value in the range, 
press OK. So this is the first value. OK. And then, of course, the, the values should be ordered in the correct order. And you can move them up and down here if they are not. Um, and then we'll go to the last value. That's a gray. I would like maybe a yellow endpoint. So I change that to yellow. And then that's the last. So now I created a color range from blue to yellow. Blue samples are uh, represent a low age and yellow samples represent a higher age. Then I make this a heat map. And I again I show everything. This time I will not order it hierarchically, I would order it according to age. So I decide how I want to, to order it. Uh, I, uh, I can cluster it on the variable side, for instance, if I like. Uh, and then I want to color it by age again, like that. And if we look at we cannot really see any clear patterns here, but let's do a linear regression, which only works when you have a truly numerical annotation on age and see if we can find any genes that are correlated with age. Okay, so the correlation here is not fantastic, so I will just stop with a Q-value of 0.3, which is not very good. It tells me that 30% of what I found could be a false discovery. So one out of three could be a false discovery. But I'll stick with that anyway. Um, maybe I want to change the label, so I just double-click in the heat map and change the size of the label. I probably would like it to be symbol and maybe I would like to have age on the x-axis like this. Okay, so here we see we have three genes or three probes where we have an uh, increasing expression uh, over age like that. So let's have a closer look at those in a scatter plot. I open up a new synchronized plot and make that a scatter plot. Method tab, scatter sample, sample annotation age is what I want on the x-axis and I want a numerical scale. And then I want to select my variables here. So if I select all three of them from the active list here, I get three plots like that. If I want to look at them one at a time, I go down here and pick one of them. Um, and here you see, here we have the correlation coefficient, which is not fantastic. Um, here we have the variable ID. I double click on the Y axis to set that to symbol instead. Uh, and maybe I want to change the title to uh, age correlation, something like that. And maybe I would like to color on something else, treatment for instance, to see if I can understand anything, if this is related to treatment in any way. And then I can also use the label tool in this plot, um, say that I would like to, to label that one, that one, so on. And then I can tile the plots again, like that. So I'm just looking at my little script to see that I don't forget anything. Mm -hmm. Good. So that was workflow four. So I'm, I'm using a little more time than I, I had planned, but any questions on this? No, then we continue. So then we go to workflow five, where we are going to have a look at survival data. And we're going to show results in the Kaplan-Meier plot. And we go back here and close down this data set. And then I will open the 
survival data set. And this I already saved as a GE data file, the internal clue core data format. And then I want to open up a Kaplan Meyer plot. And here I must tell what is what. So uh, I want survival, this annotation that tells us when patients died. And we have two groups here, two treatment groups, a control group and a treated group. Now again, I might want to have this thicker line like that. And I also have censoring events. Uh, so patients that left the study for uh, not because they died, but because of other reasons. Okay, so here we have the control group and here we have the treated group. Uh, and it looks like if we just look at it as if the treated group survived a bit longer than the control group. And here is some metrics on that as well. Uh, so which is set here what you want to show. So here you set what you want to compare with. Uh, and, and if you want to show the conf confidence interval and the p-value and so on. Uh, so here we can see that we have a hazard ratio of 0.79. That means that it's a 21 higher uh, probability to survive uh, if you are uh, if you receive the treatment. Uh, but the p-value is not very good, as you can see. So the confidence interval is is very very wide. Um, so it's not only the, the hazard ratio, of course, but uh, the p-value, as always, is very important. Uh, so you probably need a much, for these kinds of very small differences, you probably need more data in order to be able to, to prove that th there is a real difference. And there was a hazard, so here, uh, so here is the definition of the hazard ratio. So a measure of the magnitude of the difference between the two curves um, and the interpretation of that. Okay, so that was what I was going to show you today. So any questions? No, uh, then I would just like to remind you that there are all there are more webinars. So there is a basic training tomorrow at 2 to 4.30 if you want to get hands on with the software and then you can learn how to uh, produce a couple of these plots and also do statistical ana analysis. And there is a webinar on how to import and work with different data types in more details than I've shown today in proteomics data, RNA-seq data, single cell data, for instance, and data from TCJ, 10x genomics, and, and so on. Uh, so that's on Thursday at I th uh, well, two or four, I'm not sure. So it's on the same uh, web, web uh, webinar page where you as where you register to this webinar. Okay, uh, then uh, unless there are any questions, uh, if you Jin Su, if you would like like to stay, we can take your question uh, uh, in in just a minute. So then I would like to thank all of you for uh, spending time with me today. You are very welcome to contact me uh, at this email address. I will send out this presentation, including the, the uh, steps here, if you would like to, if you have a trial version, I would like to try this yourself. Uh, and you can send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Have a nice day and stay safe and hope to hear, hear from you again. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.